When I was growing up in the church, we were taught the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. I was in high school before I encountered a Christian who had never heard of it. They thought I said raptor, that it was a dinosaur. But the doctrine of the rapture is one of the most contentious matters of discussion in the church today. I quickly learned that there was a deluge of views and opinions on the matter. Although there are Christians who do not believe in the rapture, they are a very small minority. For most, the question is not if, but when and who. In this episode, we're going to attempt to answer those questions and even more. When, how, who, where. We'll also try to correct many false assumptions and theories. Let's get something out of the way here at the beginning. It is one of the shallowest, most ignorant questions on the subject, I believe. There are those who say that the word rapture is not even found in the Bible. Well, they are partially correct. It is not found in the English translations. But let's dive a little deeper. First, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore encourage one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4 13 through 18. The phrase caught up in verse 17 comes from the Greek harpazo, which means to carry off, to grasp hastily, to snatch up, to seize and overpower. The Greek harpazo is translated as rapamore in the Latin. And our English word rapture comes from a transliteration of the Latin, so technically the rapture is in the Bible. Taking some time to look at the different views concerning the rapture would be beneficial to our discussion. First, however, you need to know about the millennium. When we talk about the millennium, what we are talking about is the kingdom that Christ sets up in the earth. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that he must be released for a little while. Book of Revelation 20 1 through 3 There are three mainstream views on the subject. They are premillennialism, postmillennialism and amillennialism. Preterism is also a view, but we will get into that later on. Although these three are the main views, there are also different varieties within them, and there is no way that we can cover it all, but here are some of the highlights. Premillennials fall into two different camps. Historical premillennials are those that believe that after the tribulation Jesus will return and set up a literal kingdom on the earth for 1,000 years. In this case, the church is raptured after the tribulation, but before the beginning of the kingdom. Dispensational premillennials believe that before the seven-year tribulation, or during the middle of it, Christ will rapture the church, snatching up the living as well as the righteous dead through the resurrection. 
Christ will then return again at the end of the tribulation to set up the literal 1,000 year kingdom at the end of which Satan will be loosed for a season to tempt and try the nations once more culminating in a final battle in which Satan and his army are defeated after which God will resurrect the wicked dead judge them at the white throne judgment and cast them into the lake of fire Satan and his demons, as well as all the wicked dead, as well as death and hell itself, are thrown into the lake of fire. Christ will then renovate the earth and heaven with fire, setting up his eternal kingdom once and for all, doing away with the curse and all the former things which came with it. Postmillennialism says that the thousand year reign is symbolic. Christ will not sit on a literal throne. Rather, there will be a gradual period of time during which the world will become more and more Christian. Christ will return when this process is completed. This is what drives the actions of groups like the NAR, the New Apostolic Reform Movement, and their Dominion Theology. Amillennialism is the pessimistic version of postmillennialism. It believes that the kingdom of God was inaugurated at Christ's resurrection, at which point he gained victory over both Satan and the curse. Satan is currently bound, and Christ is even now reigning at the right hand of the Father over his church. However, the world in this view will not gradually become more Christian. After this present age is ended, Christ will return and immediately usher the church into their eternal state after judging the wicked. The terms utilized in categorizing the views on the timing of the rapture use the seven-year period of tribulation as their reference point. Pre-trib means that the church, which is pure and ready, will be raptured before the Antichrist rises to power and Daniel's 70th week begins. Mid-trib suggests that the church will have to go through half of the period of tribulation and then will be raptured. Those who hold to a post-tribulation rapture believe the church will go through Daniel's 70th week and then meet the Lord in the air when he comes to fight the battle of Armageddon. Preterism is an entirely different animal altogether. Preterism teaches that all prophecies concerning the end times, the resurrection, the tribulation, and so on, were all fulfilled and completed in 70 AD. Preterists believe that the destruction of the Jewish nation signals the completion of the Old Covenant and the beginning of the New. They believe that Jesus returned in 70 AD, although only in judgment. They believe the resurrection happened, but that it was only a spiritual resurrection. The book of Revelation was symbolic language to describe events and persons who were active at the time. To preterist, Nero was the Antichrist. Preterism is growing in popularity, but it truly is a modern view. No one throughout the history of the church has ever ascribed to it. That does not rule it out within itself, but it is one of the many things which has caused me to question its conclusions. Another thing is the fact that the resurrection that Christ prophesies about is clearly going to be a physical one. Listen to N.T. Wright on the subject. If you believe in resurrection, you believe that when the person dies, they are dead for a period whether it's a few days or a few thousand years or whatever, and then at some future date, that person will be raised to a new bodily life. Resurrection was never a way of saying, in other words, John Brown's body lies mouldering in the grave while his soul goes marching on. They had ways of saying that, and resurrection was not one of those ways. You can check this out. I've written it up. Other people have written it up. It shouldn't actually be controversial. Uh, Geza Vermesh, 
leading agnostic Jewish scholar in Oxford has recently published a book on the resurrection with a very unsatisfying conclusion, but he makes it quite clear at the beginning that in first century Judaism, that is what resurrection meant, a newly embodied life after a period of being dead. Rather, the Jews of the time, some of them, not all of them, the Pharisees who were among the leading uh, theoreticians, as it were, the early rabbis in Judaism, they believed in resurrection because they believed in a good creator God who was going to sort the world out once and for all, eventually. If you believe in a good creation and in a God who's going to put the world right finally, then one of the likely places you'll end up is saying he will have to raise people from the dead. We'll come back to why that is so in a minute. And then, of course, it goes on that in that new world, those who are in Christ will be given new bodies. The resurrection of the body. It's a totally strange doctrine to many devout Christians who really do think that the name of the game is to get their soul into a disembodied place called heaven. And when they say, I believe in the resurrection of the body, in the creed, they think, but don't really mean that. We, we actually know it's the immortality of the soul. Well, that's just being fooled by the incipient Platonism of much Western culture. But if you have that vision of creation and that vision of justice, then resurrection, as I said, is where you get. And the point is this. The physicality that we are promised in the future is an immortal physicality. Immortality doesn't mean disembodiment. That's a platonic lie. It is, Paul says, an immortal physicality. It will go through death and out the other side. It's not a resuscitation. It's a different body, but in continuity with the present one. And I sometimes put it like this. If you're with somebody who you know and love, who's then very sick, you come out of the hospital and you say, poor old so-and-so, he's just a shadow of his former self. You know, the Christian good news is this. If you are in Christ and indwelt by the Spirit, you are just a shadow of your future self. There is a real you which is more like you than you could ever imagine, if you see what I mean only somehow fuller and richer and stronger. And all the things about you which God has done in you, enhanced and ennobled, and all the things which are decaying and need to die, done away with. And if that isn't good news, I don't know what is. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, when he talks about the new body which we are waiting to put on, on top of the present one. That's a metaphor, of course, in terms of clothing, but he says that's some way of expressing what it'll be like. There are hymns which celebrate this. Oh, how glorious and resplendent, fragile body shalt thou be, when endued with so much vigor, full of health and strong and free. Wonderful picture. Now, there are passages which have already been fulfilled, which are erroneously interpreted by dispensationalists. But preterism is not consistent with the whole of our received revelation. It is clear from Scripture that the resurrection will be a bodily one. But when and how does it happen? The Bible speaks of two resurrections, not two occurrences, but two types. The first resurrection was started by Christ, and it is the resurrection of the righteous. He was the first fruits of them which slept. This resurrection will take place in phases before the beginning of Christ's 1,000-year reign, if you hold to a premillennial view. It started with Christ, and it will continue with rapture whenever that happens. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast tore its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. 
Book of Revelation 20, 4 and 6. All of those who join in the first resurrection, which includes the catching up of the living, will be glorified and rule with Christ for eternity. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Revelation 25. The second resurrection will take place at the end of time and is of the wicked dead. They will be raised and judged by Christ at the white throne judgment, afterwards to be thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. In the first episode of this series, we tackled a lot of errors and fallacies concerning the end times. But let me give you a few about the rapture, regardless of when you think it will happen. Many times in sermons and talks on the matter, people will try to drive home the necessity of getting right with the Lord by emphasizing the nearness of His coming. There is nothing wrong with this, and in fact, the imminency of Christ's return is a vital part of our teaching. However, the statement is erroneously made that the signs of the rapture are all around. There are, in fact, no signs given concerning the rapture. There are signs which point to the day of judgment and to the coming of the Lord, but nothing specifically pertaining to the snatching away of the saints. A staple for the evangelical world, especially dispensationalist, are movies like Thief in the Night, Left Behind, Apocalypse, Caught in the Eye of the Storm. The Left Behind book and movies portray the clothes of Christians being left behind when they are raptured. But where does this come from? I know the premise is you cannot take anything with you and so it will fall where you were. Some movies show even these clothes being neatly folded. The presence of empty outfits everywhere makes for an interesting camera shot, but is it biblical? The truth is, I can't say it won't happen, but there isn't any precedence in Scripture, even with the few who have already been raptured. Yes, there have already been some that have been snatched away. Elijah was called up into heaven on a chariot of fire. He dropped his mantle to Elisha, but he didn't leave his clothes behind, folded or otherwise. When Enoch was snatched away, we have no record of his clothes being left behind. When Jesus was caught up into the clouds, he did not drop his robe. In Revelation 11, when the two witnesses are resurrected and raptured into heaven, there is no mention of them leaving their clothes behind. Opponents of a pre-tribulation rapture, who are also anti-Pentecostal, often try to attack the doctrine through ad hominem attacks against a woman by the name of Margaret MacDonald. MacDonald was an early Scottish evangelical during the 18th century. She was a part of the Irvingite movement, which was a Pentecostal movement at the time. Supposedly, MacDonald would go into trances, and it was in one of these trances where she would begin to reveal the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. 
The claim was made by a post-tribulationist named Samuel Prodexe Trigales. Trigales hated John Nelson Darby and his teachings on the pre-tribulation rapture. He really hated the Irvingite Pentecostal movement. So in order to kill two birds with one stone, he claimed Darby got his teachings from this crazy woman in this crazy group. The point of this is not to defend or critique the doctrine of the Irvingites, but rather to examine this claim which has been parroted by David McPherson in many of his books such as The Rapture Plot. The problem with the claim is that Darby believed the Irvingite movement was of demonic origin. Why would Darby have used what he viewed as demonic information as the basis for his views on the rapture? Another problem with this theory is that MacDonald was a post-tribulationist. Although there is more, let me add just one more nail to the coffin. MacDonald's utterances or trances started in 1830. Darby wrote his teachings in 1927, three years before he was exposed to MacDonald. Here is one which draws fodder from both sides. Is the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 about the Jews or the church? This is one of the most important eschatological statements in Scripture because it is the words of Christ and who would know better about the end than Him? Now, I'll deal with the Olivet Discourse in an episode of its own soon, but let me give you this. Matthew 24 is not for the church but for the Jews. Now, there are those who do not agree with this conclusion. Go back to Matthew 24 and see the exact same elements in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Look at Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. And sometimes I want to just ask people, what part of after do you not understand about this passage? But it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man. The Son of Man was something that Jesus called himself while he was on this earth. He said, they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. All the same elements. Jesus is coming in the clouds. A trumpet sounds. He sends the angels to gather his elect. Keep your finger there and just go to Mark 13. Now, Mark 13 pretty much says all the same things that Matthew 24 says. It's, it's what the, we would call a parallel passage. A lot of people will attack this chapter and say this. You can't get your doctrine on this from Matthew 24 because Matthew 24 is only talking to the Jews. Okay, look at the last verse of Mark 13. Mark 13, 37. And what I say unto you, I'm only saying to the Jews. Don't let any preacher try to tell you this is for all believers. It's only for the Jews. Is that what it says in Mark 13, 37? No, it says, and what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. It's almost like he knew that people would say that. What Stephen Anderson fails to note or doesn't know is that the statement he uses in Mark is Christ simply harmonizing the version with the Matthew version. In Mark, unlike Matthew, only a few of the disciples come to Jesus. When Jesus says, what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. What he means is that he will say, has said, and is saying the same thing to the other disciples. And in fact, to everyone who will listen. This does not change the fact that to what he is referring is in reference to the Jewish people. Jesus left the temple and was going away, when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? 
Matthew 24, 1 through 3. In a possible parallel passage of Luke 17, Jesus is talking not only to his disciples, but to the Pharisees. Whether this is a different occasion or added detail is irrelevant to the point. But it makes even clearer here who Jesus and what Jesus is talking about. But it makes it even clearer here who and what Jesus is talking about and to whom. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Luke 17, 20 through 21 Not everything Jesus says here is future to us even though it was future to them. Some of it was fulfilled in 70 AD, and other things are yet to come. We'll break it down more later, as we have said. Now, one more thing before we switch gears. In verse 34, Jesus talks about the elect. Is this talking about Israel or believers in Christ? Well, the answer is both. The Greek elekos, meaning chosen, picked out, refers to the Jewish people here. The Jews were people who were picked out to be the special chosen people against all other people around the world. They were the children of Abraham and the natural branches of the vine. After Christ's work of atonement, himself being the seed of Abraham, those who placed their faith in him were those elected and chosen out of the world. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John 15, 16 The natural branches which did not bear the fruit were cut off and cast into the fire. And we were grafted in, reconciled to God through a spirit of adoption. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8.15 and we know that for those who love God all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined he also called, and those whom he called he also justified, and those whom he justified he also glorified. Romans 8. 28 through 30. In Matthew 24, when Jesus is talking to the Jews about their destiny, he is using the term elect in reference to them. Still to this day, they have a place in God's plan because of the covenant he made with Abraham. Daniel's 70th week is mainly for that purpose. So remember the full context is what determines accurate interpretation. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. 
otherwise you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Romans 11. 17-24. Now, what do I believe? Having articulated to you what others believe, let me tell you where I fall on the matter. In a previous episode, we talked about the language of the ancient Jewish wedding, which Christ used as the framework for his eschatological statements and proclamations. With that framework in mind, understand, Christ is the groom coming for his bride, the church. He is coming with the sound of trumpets. He will take his bride back to the honeymoon chamber, a room he has built onto his father's house, and he will enjoy a week-long honeymoon period with her, at the end of which witnesses will announce them and they will return to the community for a great feast during which they are considered king and queen. The wedding allegory even covers the fact that many professing Christians are in fact not really living for the Lord and thus will not be ready when He comes. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. And while the foolish were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now I do not classify myself as a dispensationalist, but I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe Daniel's 70th week is our honeymoon week. The honeymoon chamber was never meant to be a permanent residence. We're not leaving this world to live in heaven. After the honeymoon, we're going to return with Christ and rule and reign with Him. I not only believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, but in fact, there are multiple raptures within the first resurrection with varying sizes and targets. And so seemingly contradictory passages are actually talking about separate events. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15. 19-22 The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Matthew 27. 52-53. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying, He ascended. What does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Ephesians 4. 8-10 And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, 
two men stood by them in white robes. Book of Acts 1. 9 through 10. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4:17. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Book of Revelation 7. 1 through 4. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Book of Revelation 12. 1 through 5. But after the three and a half days a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. Book of Revelation 11. 11 through 12. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Book of Revelation 7. 9 through 14. Now I want to leave room for the fact that I may be wrong. I don't believe I am, but it is possible. But this view is the one which answers all the questions fully, while other theories and views are lacking. But as you will find throughout this series, there is so much error in traditional dispensationalism and in all its variants that eschatology has been made into a joke in many instances. Sometimes the simplest, most plain explanation paints the clearest and deepest picture. There's so much more that we could get into, but we've come to the end of our time today. This has been a Cross Life Church production, and I've been your host, Pastor Daniel Gamble. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, God bless. <laughs>